Um, so there were some men here, but the vast majority were women, children, and old people, and they occupied um, this community. Um, they had a station of, of uh, they had um, troops and uh, constabulary stationed permanently here on Pariaka. Um, they had um, uh, the right, they had a right, uh, what do you call it, right, terms of right, which is like a right act, which meant that, that no, no gatherings of more than 25 people were allowed in this community. So even at a tangihanga, you weren't allowed more than 25 people in one place at, at any given time. Uh, the one time they defied that, that, um, that decree, um, the, uh, the troops burnt nine of the key buildings within Pariaka as punishment for defying that. So for three years, um, the people of Pariaka lived basically under house arrest. They, um, the government instituted a permit system. No one was allowed anywhere near Pariaka unless you had a permit. And the only way to get a permit was to be given that by the government land agents at that time. So they knew who people were. On a number of occasions, people from Waikato, people from Wanganui tried to bring food because they knew when it was attacked, it was in November. And November is what happens in November, gardeners among us. This is when you plant. And so when the troops came and trampled all of the crops and destroyed all the food they found, um, the intention was to make it impossible for people to live in Bariaka so that they would have to leave simply to survive. Um, however, people stayed within Pariaka. And for three years, Pariaka was occupied. The only food that was allowed was food that was brought in for the troops. And the people who were here in Pariaka um, eat the, their, survival, their, their survival from whatever food sources they could manage that was around them for three years. Um, many of our whanau, I don't know about uh, the Paki Paki whanau, the Inia whanau or others, but many of our whanau in Pariaka are descendant of those soldiers who were stationed here because of the way our women were treated through that period there. So when the men came back from prison, they came across many children, young children, and they said, who are these brindled children? Um, or these speckled children? Um, and, um, and as a result, there are some people who are given, were given the name brindle or speckle or that to commemorate that uh, what they saw when they came back. And so many of our whānau, um, we look very pākehā from some of the things, and, uh, but in actual fact we are descendant of those soldiers and of those, those ones who were stationed through that period. Um, so after three years uh, that Pariyaka was occupied, um, over that period the government built the road right around and settled, actively settled all these areas. Um, what they did, which is really quite sneaky, is they said that they gave all of this area back to Taranaki Iwi. And they gave all of the land from Wainu, uh, from uh, Hanga Tahua all the way through to uh, Wainongoro. And, and everyone think, well, okay, so they gave it back. What was the big problem? The real difficulty was, is they gave it back, but they didn't tell anyone that they had given it back. And so they gave it back on paper in courts, and they put it, put it down on maps, but they didn't tell the people that, that's, that that was allocated to this community or that community. And as a result, because the land wasn't settled, then they deemed it land wasteland or land um, uh, not occupied land, which then they took over under perpetual leases. So those of you who know about the West Coast leases, um, so the West Coast leases were perpetual leases. Your land would be leased forever at 3% of its unimproved value. So if you leased a block, let's say your community has got a thousand acres, usually not a thousand acres, let's say 500 acres, um, that land would be leased to a Pākehā farmer for 3% of its unimproved value. So if he was to, was to lease bush, um, at 3% of that value is virtually nothing. And so up until around about, um, uh, I think it was 10 years ago, the government compensa comp uh, compensated those farmers who were still on those leases. Because when, they, when um, the, the leases, like for a, a large farm, it, they would pay a, a lease to the Māori trustee of around about $300 for a farm, for leasing that, that land. That's 3% of the, of the unimproved value. Um, the government 
decided that, and, and it would be least perpetually, it would never ever come back to the Māori owners. That was the, that was the, the strategy used for m almost all of our lands in this area. Some lands, people found out about it and they were able to settle, but a lot of those lands um, were treated in that way. And I would guess that the Paki Paki Fano, the Inia Fano, um, uh, and the Moyahu Fano in general, because I know it happened to our Fano, that's what happened to a lot of our lands. If you have shares in Parininiki Wai Totara, which most people do, if you have shares in land in most places in Taranaki, that's where most of them come from, because the government converted them into shareholdings, which then made it almost impossible to reach decisions because you can't get very difficult to get all of the shareholders together to make decisions to be able to change any agreements. So perpetual leases about 10 years ago, 12 years ago I think it is now, the government compensated, um, I've forgotten the, the exact figure, but it was, it was many million, I think it was 12 million dollars or 20 million dollars, anyway, compensated the farmers to return those leases back to market rates. And there was huge outcry for that, but they were compensated for the changing, uh, because, they, because they are perpetual leases, they viewed that land as theirs. And when they sold it, there was no difference to that block of land and the land that was freehold, uh, because of the nature of the, of the leases. So um, that's where Parininiki Waitotara um, received um, some, a little bit of compensation, not much. And the view is, is that when they um, uh, um, those leases, and, oh, sorry, it also put a uh, moratorium on those leases coming back to Taranaki for 25 years. Um, and so Parininiki Waitotara is developing, it, developing its plan as, as to how to take over that land. Uh, it's very difficult, however, because those lands, uh, if you say it's unimproved value, well then you have to pay for the felling of the bush, for the, 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 the planting of the grass, the building of the, of the, the fences, the building of the cow sheds, the, 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 the buildings on there, which means, again, millions of dollars to get the, the land back under, under your control when those leases do become available again. Um, anyway, where am I? Occupied for three, for three years. Um, the people of Pariaka were imprisoned through that period. Um, they came back to an area that was completely different to the area that they had left. Um, so most of the areas around here had been settled by many of those soldiers that had attacked Pariaka. So they were given land. So many of the families, the all of those names we know who live around this area are the direct descendants of those soldiers who were given land by the Crown. And they, it is said by, suggested by some is that the Crown actively ch sought the strongest and most hard-nosed soldiers to put into this area to keep an eye on, the, um, on Pariaka to ensure that Pariaka wouldn't uh, rise up again. Um, that's really where we get to. There's a lot more that can be said. Um, but for some families, including your whānau, we, we stayed in connection with Pariaka. We stayed and maintained our presence, even though it was very difficult to live here in Pariaka. Um, it was almost impossible to get jobs on farms in this area um, because um, the, the Pākehā farmers didn't employ Māori on their, on their farms, and if they did, it was the most, it was the most menial of, of work. The main way that Māori lived in this area was to get jobs in the cheese factories. So if you think of all of the, the cheese factories, milk, the butter factories around, dairy factories around the coast, and you go back to those times, most of the workers in that factory, in those factories were Māori. And most of the, of the whānau within, um, within Pariaka worked in those dairy factories. Um, however, we've got a situation, almost all of those, of those dairy factories have all been closed. Uh, there's only one real, real cheese factory or dairy factory in, the, in Taranaki and it's down at um, Manoa Po, down at um, Farerua, uh, uh, Fonterra. And so that's in the, in the 60s, I don't know where that time frame fits with the Paki Paki Fano, but probably in the 50s, the beginning of the 50s, people couldn't really survive much longer in Pariaka. And you see a lot of people moving out of Pariaka. Um, so numerous 
people of, of Pariaka moved to Wellington because of Fanonga. They had relations in Wellington. Um, some moved to Auckland, but not as many. Um, but most of our of our Fanonga moved to um, moved to Wellington or the top of the South Island because we had many relations in the top of the South, and we found work in those places where there, where it wasn't so what we'd say today racist or you know the antagonism towards the people of Pariaka. Um, so they moved away to be able to survive. From the 50s, 60s, we get to the 70s. There's, in the early 70s, li quite literally, there are only six people living in Pariaka. So if you chart that, it's like a ski slope down into in the, in the early 70s. Most of the houses are completely dilapidated. Some of you who, who, were, who arrived and visited, there's some of our pāke in the room. Maybe if you were here back in the early 70s, saw there were numerous old houses all around the, the Papakainga. And I see a photo, there's a photo of one on the table there where the um, Paki Paki Whanau house uh, homestead is. That is what the houses were. But by the early 70s, most of those houses are falling down. The, house, the roofs are rusted, um, there's water flowing freely into the, into the rooms, the, wall, the, the walls have become rotten. And they decided, as a collective, to pull those houses down in case children go in and are playing around, pushing the uh, things around, and the house collect collapses on top of them. So they ended up pulling down virtually all of those old houses. And we end up with a situation where we are today. In 1975, sorry, in 1968, I think it was, one person by the name of Dick Scott uh, hears about Pariaka and writes a book called The Pariaka Story. Um, prior to that, the government completely silenced all information about, about Pariaka. So from, um, from uh, I think it's 1890, it was, it was a policy of, of government, whether that's, I don't think it was written, but it was a policy, particularly in the schools, that nothing about Pariaka would be talked about in any of the schools of Taranaki, let alone anywhere in the country. And so they, and they, they, they uh, wiped it out of all history books. So if you look at history books that were written prior to 1950, and you look for any reference to Pariaka, about the best you'll come across is a crazy lunatic, uh, um, uh, these crazy lunatics of, of, um, of Tohu and Te Whiti, and they quite often refer to them as being a cult um, in, in those terms. And, um, and usually just a very short reference, um, if, if anything. And so, in, in, um, in the 60s, um, Dick Scott writes the Pariaka story, he rewrites the book in 1975. What was the book he, he republished in 1975 with a, a much expanded thing? Eh? Ask That Mountain. And when the book Ask That Mountain was published, uh, Dick Scott was vilified by historians around the country. They said he'd made up this, the, the information, he had, um, it, it was inaccurate, and how dare he, he come up with all of these, these stories that he had just, that, have, um, that he had spoken to Māori communities and they had made up those stories. Uh, however, after about 10 years, he was able to prove that all that he had written was all accurate. And before long, those, his, those historians of those times, well-known names like Sorensen and, and others, they were embarrassed by the fact that they had, had they didn't even know about Pariaka. So Pariaka had become invisible. And so by around about the 80s, when we get a renaissance in Māori language and Māori culture, suddenly people started saying, Pariaka? What happened in Pariaka? And then people started to come back to, to Pariaka. I personally started coming back in the early 80s. And um, at that time, if you were to come back, others in this room, uh, would, would be able to um, vouch for this as well. If you came to an 18th and a 19th, there'd probably only be about seven or eight people meeting and coming and uh, playing Mission was the normal normal card game. Mission is like a gambling game of euchre, but you, you, you uh, bet on your, on your cards, and with that money, that's how they paid for the food, for the keeping the days going. 